Happy to invite you uh, to welcome you to this panel, um, Canada's Image, Brand and Reputation. This is actually the very first panel we came up with when we were planning this conference, and it's turned out, uh, um, I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, the moderator of the panel, um, my dear friend Juman Shaheen. She's worked for nearly a decade in political and strategic communication in Beirut, London, and Brussels. She was closely involved in the Independence 05 movement in Lebanon, as well as in nation-building campaigns and civil society promotion throughout the Middle East. More recently, she has been involved in the organization of film festivals in China and the development of patterns of, of platforms of cultural exchange between China and the countries of the so-called New Silk Road. I should also say she's a wonderful film critic. She's published in Film Comment and other magazines. Um, she holds a PhD in communications um, from McGill University, where I had the honor of serving as her supervisor. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Juman Chaheen. Good afternoon and welcome to this panel on Canada's image, brand and reputation. It may sound a little frivolous after the previous panel we had on aid and development, but it's not really. And as Phil Oxhorn ended, I think he mentioned that there are ways of playing roles that do not necessarily involve money and reputation and image can certainly play a role in that. So um, Canada's image, or at least that of our new Prime Minister has certainly been quite discussed in international media and international circles in recent weeks. And there's no denying that the leader of a country does have an effect. But a natural image or reputation, national image or reputation is built on more than that and tends to run deeper and longer than election cycles. It's also something that has arguably become increasingly important, especially for middle powers like Canada in a world characterized by interdependence, connectedness, and competition. So what is the Canadian brand, and has it changed over time? How does it fit in with Canadians' own sense of their nation? How have nation branding strategies affected the traditional conduct of international politics and diplomacy? Is a noble brand compatible with a muscular one? More concretely, how should Canada today aim to project itself in the world? We have an exceptional panel here to help us tackle these questions. Um, I'll begin by introducing our first panelist, Melissa Aronchik. She's assistant professor in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. Our topic this afternoon is a very familiar one to her as she has written extensively on the relationship between political communication and public relations. Her most recent book is Branding the Nation, the Global Business of National Identity. She looks at the rise of the practice of nation branding and how it has changed the terms of politics and culture in a globalized world. She examines several countries, including in one full chapter, Canada. So. Melissa, welcome. Thank you, Juman, and to the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada for inviting me to talk with you today. Uh, un grand merci de m'avoir invité. Um, Juman asked us to speak rather briefly so that we would have more time to discuss together, so I will keep my remarks short. For over 10 years now, as Juman mentioned, I've been thinking and writing about nation branding and its consequences for national identity in a global context. When I started writing about nation branding all the way back in 2003, no one knew what I was talking about. Uh, I would go to present my work at conferences, uh, including one uh, early MISC conference here, and spend half of my presentation explaining what nation branding was and what it meant for international relations, for global consumers, and for domestic leadership. Now, nation branding is a massive industry, complete with professional branding consultants, political advisors, and national image managers. The nation branding industry has also spawned various tools to me measure the quality and strength of the nation's brand. 
We care about whether Canada's brand is ranked number one or number eight in the latest index, and we pay a lot of attention to polls about how Canada is perceived in the minds of our foreign allies and our enemies. Governments have finally realized, it seems, what companies have known for decades, that national identity sells. Political leaders, among others, cultivate a strong image of their country to achieve influence on the global stage. A nation's brand is used to attract potential investors, global tourists, highly trained workers, and international students. As we've seen very recently, Canada's brand has been invoked during bids for membership in the United Nations Security Council, during conversations with NATO defense ministers, during talks in Davos to attract global trading partners. The upshot is that national identity is now a political resource that a country's decision makers can draw upon to get what they want in international affairs. And this helps politicians improve their reputations at home. Nation branding is also used to shape media coverage, both at home and abroad. The brand sometimes gets used proactively by political figures and journalists to telegraph intentions. And sometimes the brand gets used reactively to weather the storm of unfavorable international attention, both short-term and long-term. For example, there's an unshakable impression in the minds of citizens all over the world that Canada is an environmentally friendly haven, a place where you can experience unspoiled natural wonders. And this image has not substantially changed despite a decade of retrograde climate change policies, tar sands exploitation, and the Keystone pipeline debates, which uh, living in America, I heard a lot about. One reason for this has to do with the way the brand has many different facets that can be exploited for different purposes. For instance, consider the way Canadian tourism promotes Canada abroad. If you look at the photographs used by the Canadian Tourism Commission as just one agency among others to attract global visitors, the promotion of Canada as a nature lover's paradise persists. A second reason is that national stereotypes are very hard to dislodge. And this can be an advantage or a disadvantage in the international community. A third reason, uh, one that uh, the last panel got me thinking about, is that we need to keep the national brand separate from the political brand. And it often is done in the minds of citizens all over the world. That is, the identity of the nation the sense of belonging and pride felt by individuals is not reducible to the brand of any one political party during its time in office. Again, that can benefit the country and that can harm it, depending on the circumstances. While I see the benefits of political branding as a valuable form of soft power, I think it's also important to recognize the limits of branding. There are some things that branding just can't do. And in my research on different countries and their branding strategies, I've tried to bring out these limits as a kind of cautionary tale. In the time I have, I'll name just three. First, we have to remember that the idea of branding comes from the corporate world and that it's more than just a metaphor. The corporate model is not always the best one to deal with issues on the national agenda. For example, Nation branding is often thought of as a competitive form of engagement. It's often encouraged as a way for countries to compete for scarce global resources, whether those resources are economic, cultural, or political, or developmental, as we heard in the last panel. But this sets up international relations as a kind of zero-sum game, where one country's advantage becomes another country's loss. It isn't always helpful to think of national identity as a competitive commodity that can be traded upon to gain advantage over others in a global marketplace. The second issue is that branding is not designed to recognize cultural difference. Branding is about creating and communicating a very tightly packaged set of marketable values. And complex issues like cultural diversity do not fit very well into that package. 
what's the expression I was looking for earlier, like using a sledgehammer to crack an egg. Sometimes branding is just not the right tool for the job. But we've seen what happens when political leaders trying to prove that they are change makers marginalize issues of cultural difference to promote a narrowly defined set of goals. Finally, nation branding campaigns often have an interesting dimension to them, which is that they strongly emphasize what we could call buy-in on the part of the nation's citizens. In my research, I often heard the expression living the brand, as in the country citizens have to live the brand of their country in order for it to be perceived as authentic. At one level, of course, that makes good sense, because if you try to promote the country as something that it isn't, and not even the country's residents believe it, then it's destined to fail. But at another level, what I've seen happen with the idea of living the brand is that the country's citizens are then held responsible for the success or failure of the nation's image, while the branding consultants are nowhere to be seen. This can happen especially in countries that are very dependent on a particular kind of economic growth, like tourism. This living the brand approach diminishes the value of citizen contributions that may not lead to economic growth, but that are nevertheless held to be important, like women's rights or educational opportunities. Branding can have real consequences for building up the awareness of a nation's cultural and political goals on the global stage. But we have to remember that it cannot substitute for the actual work of building communities and equitable policies at home, and of creating ongoing opportunities for mutual respect, tolerance, and commitment to democratic principles. Thank you. Our next speaker is Colin Robertson, and I've lost his bio. <laughs> That's not right. No, because it's too intricate <laughs> no. for my... I found it. So Colin Robertson is a former diplomat, currently senior advisor to Denton's LLP in Ottawa, and working with the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. He is also, amongst other things, I have shortened the bio, Vice President and Fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, a member of the board of the Conference of Defense Associations Institute, and on the advisory board of the North American Research Partnership. He is also an honorary captain in the Royal Canadian Navy, assigned to the Strategic Communications Directorate. And he writes <coughs> a column on foreign affairs for the Globe and Mail every other week, and is, a and is a frequent contributor to other media. Please welcome Colin Robertson. Well, thank you. I should point out that uh, I'm also uh, chair of the Board of Canada World Youth, something I know that there are members here, and my friend Ann Dadson, whose uh, place in the board I took is something I'm also very proud of because it's based here in Montreal and has made a great uh, contribution to Canada and the brand of Canada by sending uh, Canadian youth abroad and bringing people back for now over 40 plus years. So uh, th th that has something to do with branding. I thought I would start with a couple of stories. The first story, it's appropriate, especially given the question my friend Andrew Cadell asked of Mr. Clement about Canada and the Security Council. I was a young diplomat in the late 70s and posted to the United Nations, and we were on the Security Council at the time, and I was with a group that we actually don't pay a lot of attention to. I hope we will more in the future. It was the Commonwealth Caucus, and my British colleague, had turned to us and said, ah, you're Canadian. And I said, yes. And he said, yes, you get the best of the three uh, cultures. The first, you, have, uh, you get British government, French culture, uh, and uh, American gusto. <laughs> to which the Australian in the crowd said, and you, some of you heard, turned and said, no, you've got American culture, French government, and British gusto, whatever that might be. <laughs> but the point, I think, was that here is this remarkable country. We really are a great melange. Uh, you know, Ban Ki-moon is today meeting with uh, Justin Trudeau 
And one of the things they will be talking about will be pluralism. And I think pluralism uh, in Canada really does work. We are unique, and if uh, having listened to Mr. Clement thinking, what is it with the, if we were to be pushing, I do think Mr. Trudeau will be doing this. Uh, in fact, I know across government now, they're looking, can you, we do pluralism better than anybody else. Uh, we may not do it perfectly, but we do it better than anybody else. And uh, if you think about it, our largest city, Toronto, more than half the people were born outside of Canada. In Montreal, it's about 48%, and in Vancouver, our next big city, it's about 45%. Uh, and we, we do it, uh, remember, since 1980, half of our migrants have come from Asia, a different approach than what you would get from the United States, for example. And for those of you who are watching this American presidential campaign, which has been, uh, just, if nothing else, unpredictable, uh, you, will, you will see there's a big difference in how Americans regard immigration and how Canadians regard immigration or how we do pluralism. So I would start off by saying I think that's a, a, a major asset that Canada has, that you, you, you do it, and it's not branding. I think as you've just pointed out, you know, you, you can, I've worked on several branding campaigns when I was uh, with Foreign Affairs, and at the end of it, which we always concluded that you can brand on a particular issue, take investment, and so for example, the Prime Minister going to Davos recently and talking about, and this is a shift from the previous government, that. We, we have resources, but he would rather we be known as a resourceful people. Well, then you have to sit down and say, all right, what do you mean? How are you resourceful? And, and then you get into things like what are the tax regime is? What are the incentives you provide? What are the universities you're providing? What is it that you've invented recently? And so for many, many years, we, 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 part of our brand was the ubiquitous BlackBerry. But uh, you, that too has faded you now. If you want to get ahead, you have to keep in a period of continuous innovation, which is again another cross-cutting theme with this new government along with pluralism that they're uh, trying to drive forward. Um, a, a, another a friend of mine, Evan Potter, has written a book. I was talking about this on, a brand, on public diplomacy and branding of Canada. And uh, I spoke to him in preparation for this panel. And, I said, what did you come up with conclusion? He said, well, in terms of branding, the, the, there are certain events that countries actually can get involved in uh, that, that do make a difference. He said, Tony Blair tried a bigger of, of a few years ago, but it didn't really succeed. He said, the most successful, and I think this is probably true, is through sports events. Uh, and you see this, whether particularly around Olympics, and if you think about it, uh, or expos, you think of in, in this uh, country, Expo 67 here in Montreal, and then the Montreal Olympics, and then more recently the Vancouver Olympics. And uh, he observed that of the Vancouver Olympics, he thought the one thing that came out of that that was actually good for the Canadian psyche was the, the, the slogan that we arrived at, uh, which was go for gold. Instead of kind of settling for bronze, which had sometimes been the Canadian sense, we'd go for gold. And uh, the, uh, some of the polling has been done after that suggested uh, that the, the millennial generation has actually bought into that and are quite proud of it. And that is, so that's something that actually works. And he then pointed out what the Australians had done with their Olympics and of course with the Chinese. For them, the Olympics uh, that they hosted were, really were almost a coming of age ceremony uh, for, uh, for China. Um, as for Canada, and I do think leadership matters, but perhaps not as much as we might think. Uh, I went back and looked at some polling. The BBC every year does a look at countries. Where do they rank? Uh, and it's on sort of likability and dislikability. And uh, since it, they, they go back to the 80s, and I went back, and it's, they haven't run it every year, but it's basically looking at the G20 countries with a particular emphasis on Europe. And in fact, the Canada brand, even despite what we might have thought over the last decade, didn't change that much. We are always on the top three of the most liked countries. Germany, Japan are up there. Uh, again, they don't cover all the countries, but they cover a significant number. And then our dislike factor is remarkably low. It is usually, we're at the top of the, we are liked. We are generally extremely well liked uh, by uh, countries. So that, uh, notwithstanding what we might think in terms of governments come and go, but does it really affect how people view us? Uh, Again, the evidence would suggest, at least for the broader public, not so. For diplomats, I think it's different. Uh, I do think that the past decade, we, we didn't play and we were seen not to play. And certainly, I spend a lot of time in talking to diplomats in Ottawa. And uh, 
they were pleased to see the change in government. Uh, I'll leave you with one last uh, uh, reflection. I was in Kazakhstan in December and uh, there with a group talking to the Central Asian Republics about Canada and what, uh, how, how we manage things, particularly border security, which is quite different how they do it there, nuclear security, and we also talked about pluralism. But I'd gone into a, into a shop in Astana, and if you've ever, anybody here been to Astana, it's this remarkable new capital created by uh, uh, the president about 20 years ago, in part because the Russians were starting to push further south and so that he purposely moved the capital closer to the uh, Russian border to indicate this really was Kazakh territory. Uh, so it looks like something out of a Star Trek movie. It was, the, the, uh, the architecture is, uh, shall we say, uh, remarkable. Uh, and I'm, I'm in the shop and somebody comes up and says, can I help you? And I he says, oh, you're from abroad. And I said, are you American? I said, no, I'm Canadian, A. And uh, he then says, ah, Canada. Uh, new prime minister. I said, yes. And he said, your new prime minister, he looks like Canada. <laughs> And I thought, you know what? If we want a brand, that's not bad. <laughs> uh, internationalist, uh, enthusiastic, optimistic, and as we're seeing today with him hosting Ban Ki-moon, which is a bit of a, uh, where they are going to, he's going to emphasize three big issues, refugees, which I think plays to our pluralism. And the fact is, again, we've taken a very different approach than our neighbors to the south, who we sometimes are confused with. Uh, he's going to talk about climate, where I think Canadians, and, and polling shows this, that Canadians prefer us to be green. After all, we've got this remarkably uh, successful country on that. And even during the last decade, notwithstanding what you said, there was still this sense that Canada was green. And I, I do think that in many ways that part of the Conservative Party was an aberration to that of Brian Mulroney or even Preston Manning, who says, after all, the root of conservative is, after all, to conserve. And. Uh, 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 and he's also talk, going to talk about, uh, say, climate, refugees, uh, and he's going to talk about pluralism. So th these are all good things, and I think that, in a sense, is not a bad brand for us to have, but then the question becomes, how do we apply that brand, and what is it we actually do? And this is where policies really do make a difference, and where governments can make a difference. And it's not just the national government, it is also, bluntly, uh, provincial governments, uh, who are increasingly active on the sports stage and municipal governments, given that 80% of us live in big cities. Thank you. you gonna go? Shall I introduce you first, perhaps? Or, or do you want to? <laughs> uh, yes, it's true. Everyone does have your bio, but. So, Sharon Jeet Parmar is an international human rights lawyer, currently working as an anti-corruption expert for PricewaterhouseCoopers UK in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Did I get this right? Yes. <laughs> she has a long and extensive experience working in over a dozen countries across Africa and Asia on human rights, gender, peace and security issues for a number of international organizations. She has also served as a war crimes prosecutor with the Special Court for Sierra Leone and has taught human rights, international human rights, under the human rights program at Harvard Law School, with which she is still affiliated. Thank you. The is yours. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to participate. And thanks to the organizers for putting together such an excellent event and assembling what already seems to be a very good group of, of people here. So uh, as you've heard, our new government is keen to rebrand Canada. And rather than hitting the reset button, I'd like to argue that it's important to look at what is our legacy on the international stage and how can we build off of what we've achieved already. And in doing so, I'd like to highlight our track record based on two areas. Um, first is the children in armed conflict agenda, and the second is international justice, both of which happen to be within my areas of expertise. <laughs> so in order to do that, I'd like to answer three questions. First of all, what have we achieved and how? Where are we now? And where do we need to go moving forward? And to address these three questions, I'd like to highlight three different areas. Now, I'm a lawyer, so I'm sorry, but you're going to hear a little bit about international law and what I like to call norm development. So how do we build international law? What's been Canada's role in that regard? 
Um, second, buy in multilateral diplomacy. And third, of course, international development assistance. So where have we come from? First of all, we have a reputation of getting involved early and aggressively. If we take the children in armed conflict agenda, following the uh, publication of the Grass and Michelle report before the United Nations, Canada immediately organized a international donor conference in Winnipeg. And this conference basically brought together members of the international community and was absolutely instrumental in kickstarting the children in armed conflict agenda and starting to put into practice some of the recommendations of the 1996 Michelle Report. If we look at international justice, Canada played a key role in the negotiations over the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. And based on the work of some of my mentors, actually progressed international criminal law in areas such as sexual violence and armed conflict. And this is really something that as Canadians, we should be proud of. Through these different initiatives, we've seen Canada not only galvanize international actors, build political will, but also secure funding and diplomatic commitments from our sister nations. Another area to look at in terms of where we've come from is we initiate action and we have a reputation for initiating action within multilateral bodies. Again, returning to the children in armed conflict agenda, back in, two, in the early 2000s, one of the pivotal, uh, sorry, keystone UN Security Council resolutions for this agenda, UN Security Council Resolution 1612, was essentially in limbo at the Council. Months gone by, nothing was happening with, with getting this key resolution moving forward for the agenda. Under the leadership of our then uh, UN Ambassador Alan Rock, Canada formed what's called the Group of Friends of Children in Armed Conflict. At the time, we weren't sitting on the Council. But we played a role in bringing together other states and saying to the council, you have to be held accountable to us member states. And we've noticed, as friends of children in armed conflict, that you've been stalling on this, on this resolution. And in spearheading this body at the UN, Canada managed to facilitate and secure the passage of a key UN Security Council resolution. Likewise, in terms of international justice, Canada's played a really important role, not only with the International Criminal Court, but also with the establishment and operation of other uh, ad hoc criminal tribunals, such as the uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone. Third, another area within which we've enjoyed a very good reputation has been our willingness to, to initiate action independently. Going back to the Children in Armed Conflict agenda, a really important moment for the agenda was the foundation of an NGO called the Watch List on Children in Armed Conflict. Now, the Watch List produces hard data, evidence, for the UN Security Council upon which action can be ta um, taken. And at the time, the Canadian government was willing to provide seed funding for this organization and basically get it off the ground. And this was a really fundamental moment, again, for the agenda, because Canada was saying to the international community, we believe in this. And not only are we going to support this from a normative perspective in terms of diplomacy, but also in terms of international development assistance. If we look at international justice, uh, take these, for example, the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Um, not only was the Canadian government responsible for seconding prosecutors like myself to the Office of the Prosecutor, but we also sent dozens of RCMP officers who built the capacity of Sierra Leonean police officers to investigate and facilitate the prosecutions of war crimes, and which was a really important part of not only um, arriving at accountability for what had happened in Sierra Leone, but also, as Ian knows very well, but also having um, essentially taken down a known warlord and, and problematic actor in the region, the former president of uh, Liberia, Arts, Charles Taylor. So there's a nice, uh, uh, I think, summary of, of some of the key areas within which we've enjoyed a very good reputation. Now, where are we now, and what should we do to recapture this reputation? And there have already been allusions uh, in the first panel and, and also in our panel about how this reputation has suffered some setbacks. And I would argue that it's important not only to address the setbacks of the recent past, but to do it in a manner that's constructive and builds off of what we've achieved already. So once again, if we look at the issue of what I call norm development or norm compliance, it would be really important to roll back on some of the missteps. I've recently written in an article that Canada was the only country to make an objection to the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples. Um, 
Also, Canada is yet to sign the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, which is one of the most robust regional human rights treaty mechanism or treaty bodies in the world. And Latin American countries right now are pointing to Canada and the US saying, well, they haven't signed onto the convention, so why should we bother with compliance at home? So what we do matters in terms of how other, other, other nations behave. Likewise, um, Canada can also perhaps uh, be a bit more uh, respectful of full reproductive health rights of women and girls abroad and extend our development assistance to not only maternal health but also access to abortion, in particular in uh, situations of armed conflict and in cases of war-related rape. In terms of uh, international diplomacy, I've already mentioned that it's really important to build off of where we've come from and continue, but so, and I would of course encourage everyone here to participate in and promote not only the children in armed conflict agenda, but also the international criminal justice agenda. But it's also important to continue to be flexible and champ and act as a champion and innovate in new areas. That's been one of the areas where we've enjoyed a good reputation and I think where we can continue to play a very constructive role in terms of global affairs. So this, this tradition of uh, diplomacy behind the scenes, constructive diplomacy, and but whilst all the time working off of a common set of core fin Canadian values. And finally, I'd just like to make a couple of points um, with respect to going forward on international development assistance. And this touches a little bit some of the, some of the discussion points uh, from the prior panel. Uh, first of all, Canada, it's really important that we regain our, our prior position of being flexible and being willing to fund startups. Um, and moving beyond a current perception that Canada's aid delivery operates within a very bureaucratic structure where multiple levels of hierarchy exist and that to get approvals for projects, you need to go to the top of the department. Uh, and as a practitioner, I can say that that's a really valid perception and also concern on the behalf of, of implementing partners in the field. And my final point um, is something that actually I make not just to, that, that I would not just make for Canada, but that I make for, for governments and other international organizations that, that I've advised in the past. And that is, there needs to be better, we need to do a better job in the international community of achieving what I call coherence and also coordination between diplomacy and international development. And that means flexing our diplomatic muscle and conditioning aid on basic democratic values, whether that's rule of law, anti-corruption, or other fundamental, um, fundamental values that we cherish as Canadians. And it's something where donors have said back to me, yes, we absolutely understand what you're saying, but we have no idea how to actually put that into practice. And that's an area where I would argue that Canadians can take a leadership role and be not only thought leaders, but practice leaders as we have done in the past. Thanks very much. Well, we're gonna now move on to the question period. I'm sorry if I sound repetitive. I know some of you are hearing this for the third time today, but if you can keep your questions short and to the point and also framed as questions so that you leave personal commentaries for a later time. I'll say, um, vous êtes aussi libre, bien sûr, invité à poser vos questions en français si vous le préférez, si vous êtes plus à l'aise. Je crois que tous nos intervenants sont bilingues. Et um, s'il vous plaît, essayez d'être bref et d'aller droit au but et d'éviter les commentaires personnels qui ne comportent pas de questions. There are two mics, I think. Il y a deux micros dans les allées. So, have I scared everybody into asking a question now somehow? So my name is Gautam Krishnaj and I study microbiology at uh, McGill here. <clears throat> so I have a question for uh, Ms. Aronchik. Uh, you mentioned that it's difficult to incorporate ideas such as diversity um, into a national brand. However, I think that one of the cornerstones of Canada's brand, as far as anyone you ask, is our multiculturalism and our diversity. So how have we managed to make that such an integral part of who we are on the international stage? Um, I, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think it's necessarily true that Canada is known everywhere for 
um, multiculturalism in the way that other people understand multiculturalism. That is to say, it's very much a part of Canadian sense of who we are, and as a proud Canadian, I will, I will put myself in that group. Um, but the idea of trying, when a brand is used abroad as a way of trying to gain favor, for instance, the, the trope of multiculturalism is not often seen as very effective. And what I mean by that is certainly not that it's not a value, obviously it is. But if the purpose of the branding exercise abroad is to try to attract, for instance, foreign direct investment or company headquarters to Canada, in itself, that is not often seen by foreign investors as a selling point. Similarly with tourism. Tourists don't want to come to a country for its multiculturalism. They come for the pristine scenery, the urban nightlife, and so on. So my comment is really just that certain people in certain contexts use branding in a very particular way. And when they do it in that way, multiculturalism doesn't serve them. So it ends up not getting added to a national agenda. So I, so I support exactly what you're saying, and I agree completely. I just think sometimes when the language of branding is invoked, it's invoked in a competitive spirit. And when that happens, and when it, the purpose is ultimately economic, it, it doesn't really serve the interlocutors to emphasize multiculturalism. But there is, I would just say that there is an advantage and a competitive advantage to being pluralistic, multicultural. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, Frank McKenna, former premier of New Brunswick, one of his selling points, he was a great salesman for Canada. He was later our ambassador in the United States. And he sold New Brunswick as a center for call centers because of, of the people, the many languages from the various, uh, the fact that people were, and of course New Brunswick is not nearly as, you think about it as Toronto as, as, as multicultural, but th this worked and it was one of the selling points that we would use when we were trying to pitch Canada abroad is that you can do the work in the multi-languages uh, from Canada. And, and there's, uh, I'm talking to an American colleague on defense issues and pointing out that our new defense minister Arjit Sajjan, he said this could never happen in the American military, that this man would become Secretary of Defense. Uh, you know, I, I do think that these things, uh, and they, they're not done for that reason, but they do portray a Canada. The picture of the new cabinet as they walk down the, the uh, Rideau Hall, the sort of youthful, again, this picture of Canada, which uh, you would not see in other countries. Uh, I, I, I think these do, deliver a message and they, they have a subliminal uh, commercial message. Again, we use it in trying to attract foreign investment, pointing out this is an extremely stable place to invest and you get this advantage of all these different people from different, with different ideas. It, it is, a, a, in terms of seeking investment, it works. Um, hello, uh, my name is Daniel Hachikaner and I'm a, a lawyer based in Montreal. Uh, so this question is uh, directed towards uh, Mr. Robertson. Um, so it concerns uh, basically the, the theme of environment, and you, you touched on it uh, when you mentioned that the Conservative government's uh, stance on environment was an aberration. And just uh, uh, briefly, uh, the um, uh, you know Brian Mulroney was voted the greenest prime minister, um, you know, and so that that says it all. Uh, and um, uh, but at the same time, uh, you mentioned that let's say Canada was was liked internationally, but our image has been been you know let's face it tarnished after 10 years of the Conservative government, in, in the sense, in, in, in the respect of environmental preservation, we've won the Fossil Award many times and so on and so forth. So just to, 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 to continue the theme of, you were, you were giving some advice to, to Mr. Trudeau, uh, what do you think that he needs to do to, uh, uh, to, to fix this, this issue, uh, quite, quite simply? Um, I don't think it needs much fixing. I just think he has to be authentic. I think he is green. I think that he represents for the mainstream of Canada was. And I use the word aberration because it was a, a question put to me by a senior Korean diplomat who was through, who was asking about Canada and its uh, the the previous government's approach or non-approach on on internationalism. You know, the, the the there was a kind of a trite slogan a few years ago that Indigo and Chapters using the world needs more Canada. Well, it was a bit smug, but there was actually something to it, especially when we were not seen to be playing that role of bridge, helpful fixer, link, uh, Commonwealth uh, heads of mission. It, that meet in Ottawa, I, would, I spoke to them uh, last year. And, and again, the, the, the view from this, this multi-hued group was that when would Canada come back? And it, it had a lot of countries perplexed. Why were we doing this? Uh, and 
I didn't think a lot of it, but the fact that others were commenting on this, that why was Canada absent from its traditional role? So, you know, I, I couldn't help but reflect on uh, Mr. Clement's comments. <laughs> I looked across the three. Well, in the Middle East, you had Ashton Carter, who's the Secretary of Defense, and he's pretty hard-nosed. I've talked to him. He's, he's quite happy that we're doing trainers. We don't have to send in the jets because the, the Brits and French do this, but they do need more trainers. And one of the reasons they need more trainers is because they don't have the languages in the American that we do in Canada. So that is actually a much more useful role for us to play there. Uh, on, on the engagement with the Russians, frankly, the Americans were very unhappy when we took the tough measures we did, particularly ending Operation uh, Eagle up in the north, because we, this was an opportunity for the Americans and Canadians to engage the Russian military. We knew that we wouldn't be the only talking to them through other French, but on the Arctic, it was very important that that dialogue take place, particularly with the Russian officer class, because the Russian officer class is not necessarily in uh, tandem with Mr. Putin. So by, by shutting that door, the Americans were a bit cross, and it was un-Canadian, because that's one thing that we do very well is uh, keep the doors open. In Iran, you know, we have no influence. People say, well, why don't we do a bit more? Well, you can't have influence if you're not there. Again, the Americans and the Brits were very unhappy when we shut the doors for principled reasons, but from their perspective, it was much more useful to, uh, to the broad alliance if Canada had stayed in Iran, because then we were there to listen. Uh, and again, we don't bring a lot to the table, but we, what we do bring is this international network, which you have to be able to play it. And, and as you probably know, the relationship between the, our diplomatic service, which used to be really good, uh, and the former government was one of, I would term of mutual contempt. So I think that the, the government will, will put more emphasis on because there's an expectation by other countries that we can play that useful, helpful fixture, that bridge role. And I think Canadians are extremely comfortable with it. Just to add, to speak specifically to the environmental issue, yeah. uh, we cannot discount the impact of um, context. And when Mr. Trudeau came to office, he was essentially handed two gifts. One was Obama rejecting the Keystone <laughs> Pipeline. <laughs> Um, well, in fact, perhaps three. There was the Paris Climate Change Summit, which he knew to take advantage of. Uh, so events such as that really, in fact, set the red carpet in front of Trudeau to, in fact, before he's even enacted a single policy, to be seen as a very green uh, prime minister. <laughs> it helps. I, I have a slightly different perspective on our, on our reputation, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa on environmental issues, and that's related to the question of corporate social responsibility of Canadian mining companies. Um, and then also, I imagine it, it's, this perspective is shared in Latin America, where Canadian mining companies it's been, you know, have been well documented to be responsible for um, very serious environmental uh, violations as well as other human rights violations, um, either by using their own security, for, um, like security uh, actors or using security forces of host governments. And, and the lack, I mean, there have been UN guiding principles that have been re uh, recently drafted that are quite comprehensive on this issue. And, we could endorse that in no better way than to enact legislation domestically holding Canadian, responsibil uh, Canadian companies responsible at home for violations that um, they commit abroad based on the principle of extraterritoriality. And this is because uh, in many of these countries, the rule of law is very weak. It's very easy to, to evade accountability. So uh, my perspective on our reputation is slightly different and, and very much informed uh, by my work with local communities and, and civil society. And I, um, I just want to say another thing. What's really interesting is, so um, during the last, there was a question about what can we play the role in the Francophonie or, or in the Commonwealth? And, and I remember, so um, I've been based in the Democratic Republic of Congo for the last five years, and the Francophonie was held in the Congo. And it was great for us expats because all of a sudden downtown Kinshasa was beautiful because all of these people were coming. Um, and, there, and actually, it was a big surprise because Prime Minister Stephen Harper actually came um, to participate. And, and the rumor, and, and I, I only say this because perceptions actually matter, the rumor was the real reason why he was coming was um, not only because 
Congo is, is obviously uh, has been known and, and has had some serious um, wars over its mining uh, natural resources and, and, and et cetera. Um, but the rumor was is that he was here because he was on a, he was on a mission to dissuade African countries from, from supporting uh, climate change initiatives at the international level. Now, whether that was true or not, <laughs> I don't know, it sounds a little bit conspiracy theory-like, but the point is, is this is what, this is what was circulating amongst the, the, the diplomatic community in Kinshasa. And so, and again, it made us look like we were a bunch of pariahs on questions of environment. Uh, and so it's just to say that uh, perceptions and brand really do matter, and it affects your ability to, be, um, to influence others. So my question is for Sharanjit. Um, you know, in the last panel, we were asked a question about corruption, and <clears throat> we didn't answer it very well, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, you made a comment that uh, aid actors need to be more, um, I think you said conditioned to, or I, I, forget, I, forget, what, I forget what your yeah. expression was, but you're working in a place that's uh, pretty tricky in this, in this regard. Uh, you're working for, as a compliance officer for PricewaterhouseCoopers. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that, especially where aid is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, and I'm sure Colin has much to say on this, on this issue because, uh, I, I mean, essentially the point comes from uh, having worked in, in many, so I worked mostly in stale, failed states or, 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 or fragile states, which is the, the more, the nicer way to say it, uh, in the particular places that are coming out of, of, of conflict. And, uh, and more often than not, um, the government is very weak, um, and more often than not, the government is very corrupt. And, and what I've seen is, is something that was touched upon already this morning was that technical approaches to international development. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you can train the Congolese military as much as you like, um, but until they actually are trained that they're there to serve the public and not the president, it doesn't matter how much training you're going to give them, they're going to continue to violate human rights. And, and actually, the army is, is the biggest perpetrator of um, war-related sexual violence in Eastern Congo. Uh, so, so, and so based on my experience, I've just found that it's very, what's been frustrating has been this um, most um, embassies as well as um, international organizations such as the European Union keep their diplomatic arm and their development arm separate and don't, they don't really communicate with each other very often. And, and so one of my talking points in, in my advocacy has been to push these actors to actually flex their diplomatic muscle and to, to push the government beyond statements around fair and free elections or please don't run again for, for another, um, to become president again because you've, you've been here for a long time and we haven't seen anything. Oh yeah, and it happens to be against the Constitution. Um, so using, and the thing is, is for example, so our main client for this anti-corruption program that I'm working on is the British government. And it's only now, after decades of engagement in the Congo with this government, that we're finally starting to see the ambassador um, say, or actually um, what I use, condition um, aid. So the British government was um, funding a security sector reform program with the Congolese police. And after a UN report finding um, the Congolese uh, security forces responsible for major human rights violations, they canceled the program. They just pulled it out completely. And, and that, you can debate whether that made sense or not, um, given the circumstances and the context. But the message was, unless you're willing to respect what in the UK we hold as human rights values, we are not going to then um, follow through with our donor commitments. Um, when it comes to, to anti-corruption, just to get back to, to your point, or your question, is it is a tricky, it is a tricky field. And, and I would argue that um, you need to use a carrot and sticks approach. And one of the uh, methodologies that I like to use is first of all is to take a systems analysis of what's happening. So think about governance or corruption issues like a system and look at what are the entry points in the system. And it's, in, in, it's very tightly linked to governance issues. And once again, for me, the key issue is really hammering on governance issues. And that's where our diplomats can play a really important role on the advocacy side. And also, these regimes aren't homogenous. There are actors within them that do actually want to progress, you know, to see progress. And, and it's really important to identify those actors 
to build relationships with those actors, and then to use, to try to leverage their influence within a very, and, and they're looking for support too. And so I am very modest in terms of what our role is in those kinds of complex situations, but at, at a minimum, we're there to support uh, what we might consider to be the good apples, um, although that requires a lot of research and political economy analysis uh, to understand those those systems, which could be quite complex. But you've asked a really big question, which we could write a book about, probably. <laughs> I'd only say I, I'm encouraged that we, I think we're making progress. I think the, the, the things in the, through the G7 in particular, and sometimes G20, this whole idea of transparency, uh, and then at the OEC, as you yeah. say, and then. Also, uh, parliaments in Britain and Canada and Australia have saying, if you, if you do corruption abroad, you can be tried at home. This, I think, has a bit of a discipline. But I'm also uh, encouraged by, I, I work now a fair bit with the chief executive officers of big Canadian companies, and they, they think it's just bad business. They see the cost to their own business, aside from the money you put out, their shareholders don't like it. An uh, example a few years ago, Talisman was involved in, I think, the Sudan and oil. And the, in the end, the, uh, and the, the guy named Bucky from Calgary, who was a, sort of the quintessential uh, Houston, looked like a Houston oil man. He could, could have been under Ewing Oil. But he concluded this was just bad business. Uh, and I'd segue that over to, to on the environment. I, I looked at the Boreal Forest Accord a few years ago, where Canadian forest companies came to the conclusion that it didn't make any sense to keep battling with the environmentalists. Uh, on something that they felt they were always on the wrong side on. So they came up by working with the environmental community uh, with, a, with an accord, and now you don't hear much about out of the forest industry because we've, we've essentially, we're doing things in an environmentally responsible fashion. And I'm seeing the same uh, attitude shift amongst in the oil patch. I think that they, they uh, uh, and you may have seen it, Jim Prentice, the former uh, Minister in the Conservative government writing about this in part last week, and the, the, there's a the the oil patch. They've all come together, for example, and the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Group, where they're sharing best practices. And the best practices are designed to use less water and to uh, uh, to to reclaim the soil more quickly because they realize there's a real social cost to bad behavior, yeah. and um, you can't help but be encouraged. But at the same time, it's really important not to um, to create a black or white scenario. So, because this is a corrupt regime, we're going to there's going to be no foreign foreign direct investment. And part of what at least this UK funded program that I'm working on is trying to do is trying to support local markets, trying to um, what I call. Um, shift corruption dynamics, because we're not going to eliminate corruption, but change the patterns of gain, um, reduce the patterns of gain from corruption, improve the patterns of gain from, from legal activity. So because you're not going to go from, you know, what did you say, from a zero to a hero <laughs> in, oh. one, in one leap, it's, it's going to take a series, and it's certainly going to take a generation of, of interventions supported by But to take it back others. to what we're talking about branding, you, you know, mm -hmm. there's no reason why Canada can't be best in class in a lot of these things, because mm -hmm. we are, after all, what's the biggest part of the Toronto Stock Exchange? It's binding stocks Absolutely. and things. That, and resource industries is a really big deal for Canada, um, good or bad, that's the way it is. But you can be, and I, I, I think that we, that's what we should aspire to, and I think that's something that this new government is probably going to push. And I don't think you'll find a lot of resistance from the business community. Yeah, and actually just one other point, just based on, on in the Congo, I can tell you that civil society organizations are would prefer dealing with multinational mining corporations than Chinese mining mm -hmm, corporations, mm -hmm. because multinational corporations actually do care about the reputation. They are under due diligence requirements on, on local stock exchanges, et cetera, and, and it's creating that space um, for them to thrive. And the universities that pull their money out of so they, yeah. their investment funds, pension funds now acting the same way. Mm. So I think the glass is more than half full. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we only have five minutes left. You've been waiting a long time, so have you. So I'm just going to ask you to both ask your questions and you have the pen. Hmm? <laughs> we can take seven or eight <laughs> We can take seven or eight minutes? Okay, then go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Luisa Melendez. I'm a second uh, year student here at McGill in economics. And I feel you probably actually partially answered my question, so this will be fast answer, hopefully. Um, 
I, so in the UN context in general, I feel like there's been a very big move um, changing from the MDGs to the SDGs in promoting partnerships. Uh, I feel like the international community understands that development won't be possible until there is full um, partnerships between the private community, the civil society groups, and the governments. So uh, to what extent do you think that Canada can play a role in being a leader perhaps and like you said and going back to branding as well um, we have a great image of uh, Canada as a green country here perhaps abroad sometimes uh, Canadian com companies don't really have that same reputation so maybe uh, to what extent do you think Canada could be a leader in creating those partnerships and also promoting other countries to create those partnerships well, actually, uh, it's a really important question because, um, and in particular on the anti-corruption agenda, and some of my, my colleagues, uh, Congolese colleagues, have said, well, okay, Sharon, well, let's say that this project, um, which is a private sector development project, reduce, reduces corruption. Um, that just means that, the, that it's going to improve revenue collection by the government. And this government is bad, <laughs> and it's just going to spend it on themselves. So you're just basically working to, to deepen the pockets of, of a bunch of rogue actors. And, and the answer is, well, can we translate improved revenue collection with the actual provision of public services to citizens and, and then realize poverty alleviation? And that leap is very difficult. Uh, and so I think from a technical perspective, there's the Canada, Canada has a lot of experience in terms of, of, and I mean, even just within this room, we have a lot of experience. Um, all of us have worked in different countries. And it would be, you know, pick your subject, but it's a question of looking at lessons learned and, and trying to, you know, once again be thought leaders and then support that with, with funding, with international development assistance um, on the ground. So I think that on that, in terms of forging public-private civil society partnerships, um, it's certainly a la mode, we could say, <laughs> but there's a long way to go before those partnerships are going to actually reach the most marginalized um, populations in the global south. I take a slightly more critical perspective on public-private partnerships, but not in the context in yeah. which you're describing, more just in I think we have to be very careful to, perhaps to your earlier point on corporate social responsibility, when companies ultimately are focused on the bottom line that, and the responsibility to their shareholders and stakeholders, that always will trump public-private partnerships. And so very often it's difficult to kind of create the agreement that is really going to benefit the public sector, really going to benefit the civil society sector. I don't think it's impossible to do so. But certainly in some of the nation branding projects I've looked at, not in Canada, but in other countries, I'm thinking of Eastern Europe, I'm thinking of uh, some Caribbean economies, public-private partnerships have really not benefited the citizens. They have really benefited the corporate uh, owners and their shareholders. So it's just a matter of maybe thinking about context and being careful how these get forged. I just think part of the reason I think we are good at diplomacy in this country uh, is we have to spend a lot of time at it. For us, the, the big challenges in, in Canada are geography and climate. And, uh, and we aren't one homogenous group of people. We're just, again, I made the point earlier, we're pluralistic. So internationally, I've found we're often looked to to play that honest broker role. It is a role to which we come, I think, naturally. And uh, as a consequence, if, we, if, we're, if, if the government's prepared to let us play this role and push then can, Canada can be helpful. We're, we don't always solve things, but we can be helpful in making things work. Hello. I'm Corey Albafi, working for Montreal International. We're the development agency for Montreal, and we attract international organizations, so international nonprofits, uh, governmental organizations, UN agencies, so that they settle in the city. Um, my question is an, on uh, international branding and national branding, but the other way around. How can you brand the international uh, to promote your national interests? When you bring an international organization to your country, it's an, an international body, mm. but by doing so, you brand your own stance and you brand your own values. Uh, for example, Korea, uh, they attracted the Green Climate Fund. That was a strong message to the international community that they were a green country. So how do you see the branding not of national branding abroad, but the other way around? How do you see Canada playing a bigger role in attracting the international nationally and using that as a tool for uh, interest uh, development for Canada? Uh, in the, the, the 
area in which I'm most familiar has to do with attracting international sports and international cultural events, like um, Colin mentioned a moment ago. And uh, unfortunately, the, with the countries I've seen, it has not worked out very well because often, again, the, the kinds of sacrifices or commitments that the national governments need to make in order to attract those often marginalize domestic projects. But I think that you're talking about a different kind of thing. I mean, you're not talking about bringing in the World Cup of Soccer or the Olympics or, or other, uh, other types of projects. I can imagine that there would be, there's, an, there's a need to try to establish some kind of parallel in the values between the international organization and the national values and then being able to really use media in the right way to get the kind of coverage that you want so that the not only is the domestic community aware of the presence of that international organization and what it can do, but also that boomerang effect, right? So that people internationally can be aware of the, the global nature of Canada, for instance, or its, its openness to the world, and its openness to hosting these kinds of projects. So I can answer your question from a slightly different perspective. Um, when I was teaching at Harvard, all of my students wanted to work for the International Criminal Court. And I'd be like, oh my god, no. Like, <laughs> there's, first of all, there's so much more you can do. And second of all, they're not really performing that well. So do you really want to be you know, starting out your human rights career in a dysfunctional institution? Uh, so I, what I think is really interesting for, and this is for the young uh, aspiring international practitioners in the room, is, is um, these, and all, or all of my students wanted to work for the UN. And that generated the same response, like, no, what are you talking about? They don't do anything. And so it's just, it's interesting because you've asked a really important question. And there tend to be certain tropes about what it means to do international work, whether it's in the development field or whether it's in terms of international relations and diplomacy. Um, and there's certain actors that just have a de facto reputation, whether it's the International Criminal Court, because you know, you're going in and, you're, and you're, you're, you're helping accountability efforts for some of the most atrocious things that happen on this planet. Um, but at the same time, it's very difficult to, um, to drill down and actually see how these different agencies and institutions operate. And, and I, this is where I think this supports Melissa's point. It shows you the limits of a brand. <laughs> because when you go beyond the brand and you actually look at operational, how, well, how does that brand get operationalized, which is what Colin also concluded his remarks on, you see something very different. Uh, and so I would encourage all of the students in the room um, to be as expansive as possible when you're thinking about where to go after graduation of, and where you see yourself in, on the terrain and, and, to, and to be critical, but also constructive at the same time and to definitely look beyond the brand, um, whether that's the UN or whether that's the nonprofit sector or whether it's the for-profit sector. Uh, but all of those, all of those co corners have, have, have reputations but also actually have track records on, on how they perform. So thanks for that question. I want to thank you all very much for being here and thank our panel, of course. <laughs>